Welcome to the Wealth Management Version 2.0, the Advice Tech Revolution podcast, where I'm joined by Jay Shaw, CEO of Personal Capital. On this podcast, we're focused on the business of the business, the business of advice, and specifically, we study and celebrate firms that are leveraging the combination of technology and humanity, some call it hybrid, to deliver better advice to more, more people through that combination. I call that the Advice Tech Revolution. Jay is on the front lines of that revolution and has been for more than 10 years now. Personal Capital has written a unique model of free personal financial management capabilities combined with sleek portfolio analysis and recommendations engines combined with remote advisors delivering advice virtually out of choice from day one. I should note, not, not out of the, the recent necessity. Um, doing that for more than two and a half million users on the, on the PFM side and nearly 25,000 advised clients with over $12 billion in AUM. So Jay, we'll get to your, your recent news about being acquired by Empower Retirement in a deal worth up to a billion dollars. I, I thought, by the way, you might record this with a, like a field of unicorns in the, uh, the Zoom <laughs> background or something. Um, but let's start with your, your more humble beginnings, uh, I guess a decade ago now, when you're thinking about not 12 billion, but maybe that first $12, where that would come from. Um, let's start with you the way I start with everybody. Tell us your origin story, the mission that guided your early days, and then we'll fill in the middle and, and ultimately get to how you became a, a unicorn. Great. Well, th first, Gavin, thanks so much for having me on your podcast. Um, you know, I, I, I really do respect the work that you're doing. Um, a lot of people that are trying to track what's going on in you know what we call digital wealth management or the advice revolution. Um, there's a lot of confusion that's going out on what's really happening on the frontier. But I think you have uh, a very clear and succinct vision. So uh, really appreciate being here and, and and you allowing us to tell our story. Okay, so our humble beginnings. Um, you know, I, I do always start with our mission. Um, you know, it's transforming financial lives through technology and people. Seven simple words. It's always been that way since inception. Um, and uh, it's been, you know, it's been delightful actually to start that way and persist um, the, the, the same, the, the same vision and, and strategy that we've had ever since day one. A little bit more about the, the backstory and, and maybe before I talk about the inception of personal capital, I will talk about um, a little bit of my background. So I spent, you know, 20 plus years in executive leadership, predominantly in technology and, and operations. I'm, I'm an execution specialist and I go back to the, you know, some of the original old school fintech stuff, you know, back in the dot com era. Um, you know, the thing I point to most readily is uh, the time I spent at Elon, public company, predominantly focused on the consumer credit marketplace, um, mostly mortgages, but auto lending. Um, but a lot of the traits in, in that industry, in that vertical, uh, very similar patterns to, to what we see in wealth management. When I say that, what I mean is a consumer, you know, that is generally confused about, you know, what capabilities and, and what they should which, what they should look to in getting uh, trusted advice uh, in a massive space, you know, a $10 trillion industry, if you want to look at mortgages, but a great opportunity um, in a fragmented industry to use technology and data, not only to tell a story to the consumer, but to empower the financial professional. And so that's what we did, you know, back in my time at Elon, um, again, really big space, great opportunity, and uh, did that in consumer credit, but also in banking both of which were very, very instructive in, in walking to an opportunity at personal capital. And um, it takes me back to the, you know, way back in the time, at, time machine back in 2009, it was the summertime. And I met our, our, our charismatic visionary, uh, our founder, Bill Harris. And, you know, very, you know, esteemed background, um, you know, his, his heritage uh, at running into it, also being the CEO at PayPal. He just had a very, very succinct vision. It was, it was, it was very interesting. I got to know him at the time, it was really simple. In, in, in Bill's words, let's, let's, let's turn this entire industry on its head. Um, account aggregation, and that's the principal project, and I'll talk about that in a, minute, in a moment, that's how we got started. But let's turn this thing on its head, and rather than using aggregation you know, as a barnacle on the, on the back end of the ship after a, a client has come on for whatever financial service, and then allowing them to link their financial life, let's invert that, and let's start this relationship with connectivity robust connectivity across all of their accounts to create this consumer in the middle and surround them with all their financial information. And in this industry, you know, it, it made so much sense where, you know, if we're in the business of offering holistic advice, 
what better way to start than by surrounding the customer with all of their financial information? It's, there's a metaphor to, to medicine. It's whole medicine or holistic medicine. And how could you possibly diagnose and prescribe something for that patient unless you have that holistic view? So, so that's, that was the vision that got started. And then there was a project. There was a technology project. And it was uh, you know, our, our, our founding engineer, our, our chief engineering officer, if you will, our, our other CEO in the company, a gentleman by the name of Hassan Labasani was running a project out of Bill's uh, pool house and integrating uh, the, the aggregation platform that, um, that is still you know, that, that, that core of what we do of that personal financial management system. Um, and before we even had you know, dollar zero, that was the initial project and that vision that Bill had and this mission of transforming financial lives, which, which really got the whole story started. And so that, that was back in the days of 2009. And you know, we were in stealth mode for a good uh, couple of years before we launched, but that's really what set the stage for personal capital as people understand it today. Right. And, and it's interesting because you came along and you were looking to disrupt and you weren't beholden to existing um, business models. And so that whole focus on, on, fo on starting with account aggregation and helping people see their whole entire, their, their financial lives. Um, I think you know, to your point that really set the tone of this is about you and we'll get to the, the human advice layer, but this is first and foremost about you and you getting control and um, around your financial life versus we're the all-knowing wizard, uh, everything comes through us and then we'll dispense advice and sell you products. I, I, I think that's that's something certainly when you got started, I uh, you know, it was very noteworthy for me and you've stayed, you've stayed true to that through, throughout your, your history. Um, so, and, and you really were the original hybrid, um, combining technology with human advice. Now everybody's remote, uh, of course, everyone's scrambling to create their own personal capital hybrid model. I get um, uh, calls, you know, every week from firms that are, that are trying to replicate that model. How do we optimize in a remote um, environment? So t t tell us more about how you thought about that. Um, you know, everybody around the same time as you was coming out with robo solutions, pure robo. Some of those firms have, have pivoted um, over time. But talk, talk to us about how you came up with that model and how that's that's evolved. Yeah, well, thanks for the recognition. You know, a lot of people don't know who got this started, but we, we, we feel like we were the pioneer in the space, uh, particularly with the hybrid model. Um, and that's really, you know, showing its, you know, full bloom these days. Uh, you know, it's, I guess it's no surprise that there's so much that's happening in the robo space. Um, when you take a step back, if you look at the households in the US, you know, there's, I think 70% of that marketplace is within that, you know, core retail segment. And, you know, there's, there's a Silicon Valley edict behind it too, which is, you know, proliferated throughout the country about, you know, software is going to eat the world. And um, I think in, in some measures that can be true in certain spaces, but as it pertains to wealth, um, I think that might be true in the simple part of the business or where people are starting with rel a relatively simple customer. Um, but, you know, I guess there's two ways I think about this. One is when we went and, and, and tried to abstract what's going on in the industry, I think it's true that two thirds of the country is in retail and might be thinking about getting into starting their wealth. Because when you look at when you when you permeate that and look at the asset view, it's only low single digits in terms of investable assets. So when we surveyed the industry and, and, and saw that action, and there's, there's been a lot going on in the brokerage space and in and, and retail, and it's, you know, it's, it's intensely competitive and pressure packed. And in many ways, it's a, it's a race to zero in terms of the, you know, the fee opportunity for, uh, for advisors in that competitive realm. Um, and then if you flip on the other side, you know, the 1%, if you will, the ultra high net worth, um, tons of assets, you know, you know, probably, you know, 40% uh, of the assets, but it's only by definition, 1%. Um, and I think because of that, uh, that heritage of, of providing a lot of professionals at the high end of the market, um, it, it has its own form of competition, but not, not through using technology and data and distribution. So when we look at that middle market, you know, we see about a third of the households, but very importantly, greater than half of the assets in, um, in the US marketplace. And so when we thought about this notion of bringing forward consumer technology, that, that, that nascent aggregation program, which, which blossomed into our personal financial management solution, that's to face the, the, the customer. But the customer in that middle market also demands the human. They want to have a personal touch. They don't want just the data and the technology. And so when we examine that customer, not just this, you know, the TAM, uh, we realize that customer wants to have 
personalized advice and, and, a, and a connection with a behavioral coach or, you know, a Sherpa, if you will, that, are, that is going to guide them along the way. And so in doing that per personal financial management, we also thought it was really instructive to focus on another customer in the segment, not just the consumer. A lot of times folks look at the consumer as being synonymous with the customer, but the advisor is every bit as much of a customer in this process too. Because to our mind, the shared experience of somebody who has a connected life, the consumer, with an advisor who's empowered with that data and a shared experience and the productivity and the digital tools to be able to engage in a strategic discussion, that's paramount. And, and missing that other customer um, is frankly, wasn't, was, is, is what was not uh, designed for uh, at the early stages for many of the robos that came after it, but we did. And, and I, I spent a lot of my time doing the principal work, thinking not only about how are we creating this uh, personal financial management tool, but what's happening behind the curtain with the advisor and how do we triangulate this experience between the consumer, the advisor and the planning tools and data that elicit those strategic discussions. So, so part of our design was based on dissecting the industry, but also very much based on what the customer mindset was and building the solution set with the advisor in tandem with the consumer. It's all, it kind of all comes together. And if you do it the right way, uh, the lines really blur. It just ends up being a shared strategic experience between advisor and consumer. But th that's really interesting. And, and I, I agree with you completely. S starting with that paradigm in mind, you're going to come to a very different place around the the engagement and, and how an advisor interacts with the client versus simply you know, starting robo and, and lumping in an advisor on top of that experience later or vice versa trying to just digitize something that's all driven through through an advised relationship. So the um, I, I guess the, the other really fascinating part of your model is, again, unlike your robo cousins who have, in, in some cases, no minimum or very low minimums, literally zero, maybe $500, $5,000, your minimum, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's been this way, uh, maybe from the beginning or certainly for a long time, is $100,000. Uh, your average client on the advised side has over 500,000 with you. Um, so it really flies in the face. A lot of folks out there keep equating robo and digital as those are the, the young, poor people, maybe uh, Henry's, but not people with wealth. They all want to start with a traditional advised relationship. And, and you and I know that's not true. Um, so, you know, back, back, back then, um, you know, everyone was saying no one's going to entrust that amount of money to a virtual advisor. People want that face-to-face -face relationship. So tell us, how, how did you come to that decision? Um, and let's kind of use this to pivot to your client profile. What do they look like? Um, how that profile and your the, the client base you have has driven your capability set beyond just the typical, very plain vanilla, uh, all ETF, uh, very, very simple, basic robo-solutions. Uh, absolutely. So you, you had a very interesting word that you mentioned in there, Gavin, which is trust. Trust is paramount, right? And, and I think there are a lot of naysayers when we went into this, you know, and um, of course, when we were starting it and building this thing in stealth mode, there was a little bit of self-doubt, you know, is this really going to work? Do we think that we can enter into this game and have somebody trust us to their nest egg? And in many ways, that's why we started with a personal financial management tool and allowing this consumer, and it also speaks to the consumer, um, time starved, typically, you know, head of household or, you know, um, in, in, in a relationship, may or may not have children. The way we think about that financial journey is they're, they're, right, in, they're right in the middle of it. Um, in, in many ways, it's, uh, you know, we characterize it as being the entire catastrophe. Nobody ever plans it. You know, you, uh, you might get in a relationship, you have a job, you start accumulating accounts, and before you know it, you have the whole thing. And, you know, it's 15 to 20 accounts um, and, and many times more, multiple financial services relationships. That's right. And so, you know, it's hard enough to, to, to remember all your usernames and passwords to get to those endpoints, let alone know how it all hangs together. And so, you know, what that created was uh, an opportunity to connect the entire financial life of this customer and then begin to tell them stories about, you know, the, the non-tactical things, the non-trivial things, the strategic insights that they were otherwise missing from not seeing that whole. And what happens by telling these stories and illuminating this financial life, not only where they are today, but where they're headed, um, it, it, you're galvanizing trust. 
And by virtue of galvanizing trust through this free experience um, and that engagement with the customer, they start opening up their, 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 their ears and their minds to a conversation with someone they might trust as an advisor. And as you say, you know, we decided to go into this middle market and we, we, we dropped down at, at one point down to 25,000, but we found that we do our best work in that really complex situation of a mass affluent consumer. Their, their, their life is chaotic and they don't have a lot of time um, or interest in developing expertise. Rather, they'd like to delegate and, 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 and take on a coach to help them. I mean, it, for us, it's analogous to um, that same financial journey. And you might start off doing your own tax prep. You might find a free service. Then you start doing it yourself. And then suddenly you reach this inflection point where there's just so much complexity. It might be alternative minimum tax, whatever the rule might be. And you just say, I need to hire a professional. And that similar inflection point or metaphor that you see in bringing on a tax advisor is similar in a financial coach. And a lot of times people don't see that story and that, that strategy that's before them. Um, but it's a very simple paradigm, you know, that we all learned back in grade school, which is show, don't tell. And we found through the technology and showing rather than telling, it's not just, you know, it's, the, it's not the wise person from Wall Street telling them and talking down to that consumer about how they should do things. It's showing them the story and also showing side by side an opportunity of how they might change things and uh, implement a financial plan and other aspects of portfolio management that they otherwise aren't considering. But when you show them that information, um, it, it really, it simplifies that complexity, creates an opportunity for a conversation and allows us to get to that, into that middle market. And you're right, we do have half million dollar relationships, greater than that. Um, and that's really grown and enriched over the course of time. Um, and those are new relationships. This isn't, you know, a byproduct of, of, of market appreciation. Right. And what we see is we have about, um, you know, uh, a little bit more than 50% uh, wallet share of those consumers. So these generally speaking on average are million dollar clients that have, you know, a, a million dollars in, um, in, in net worth and in, um, in, in liquid investable assets. That's the customer that we work with. And, you know, addressing that complexity first, building that trust, to usher in a, a conversation with an advisor is really um, is really what this is all about and how we've garnered those relationships that we've gained over time. Yeah, and I'm guessing quite a bit of that, those assets held away are, are likely gonna be in retirement plans, which is a, is a big part of the, the Empower source. So we'll, we'll come back to that. But so based on that, that client profile um, and to have an average uh, client account size of, of 500, plus thousand, that means you also have quite a few clients that are well north of that, um, which I'm aware of. So based on that value prop, the ability to, to look at clients' assets holistically, um, and, and to your point, really guide them, be that Sherpa, show them how they can optimize, how they can do better. And then you obviously, as a, as, as a portfolio manager, be able to, to provide fairly sophisticated capabilities to meet their needs. Speak to us about, from a technology standpoint, how did you, what's that journey been like? How did you decide what you really wanted to own outright um, and build yourself? What, what did you want to partner with to get best of breed capabilities uh, from, from other providers as well? Yeah, it's a great question. So when we think about this, this time starved consumer, you know, who's really an accumulator, you know, our bell shaped curve is thirties, forties, and fifties. Our average client is, 49 years old, they have a lot of that complexity. Um, we do have, you know, uh, the majority of our assets are in relationships where we're managing greater than a million dollars over half of our, of our portfolio looks like that. So as you might imagine, um, to address that consumer, it's not, you know, answer a few short questions and put somebody in an ETF wrap portfolio, set it and forget it, you're done. It's, it's a lot more sophisticated than that. And as we move up, you know, the, the complexity ladder with these consumers, um, we offer them more sophisticated solutions. And so we were very, very thoughtful about how we went at that from a technology standpoint. Again, it's all deeply rooted in connecting the financial life, you know, using aggregation, which is, which by the way, is just a starting point. Those are raw materials in order to refine them in a finished goods way to be able to present them to a consumer uh, is very important. So it's not just connecting those accounts. You know, we're also developing a cash flows model for that, for that, for that client. And, you know, obviously financial planning is table stakes for us and being able to, to, to not only map out the account balances, transactions and cash flows, but to be able to look at near term and long range goals and plot those out over the course of time and show somebody their likelihood of success. And that, that's, the, that's the financial planning software that we engineered 
based on the sophisticated nature of the harness of account aggregation that we've run. And, um, and over the course of time, you know, this hasn't been static. You know, when we, when we, when we started off, I would say we were more, you know, an all-in-one advisor. Over the arc of time, we've, 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 we've done cell mitosis, if you will. We've gotten much more specific as we've scaled up and we've actually brought forward a team of advisors. So we break down the technology to deliver a dedicated advise, advisor, but through a team construct. And so we actually have six or seven different actors, but they have to see a uniform view of the data in spite of that, that specialized role that they provide for a client. So bringing, in, bringing on and scaling up financial planning, for example, and building that into the software, but reflecting that in our service and delivery model through CFPs and people that are really, really steeped in tax planning or estate planning or Medicare planning or insurance planning, we're going into all those topics because now we've garnered the trust and we have a relationship. The expectation is that we provide that breadth and sophistication on an ongoing basis for those clients. So as they're accumulating and growing in complexity with their financial life, as they're nearing retirement or in retirement, um, they have more complex and specific consumer needs that we have to marry up the technology as well as the, the service model. But for the technology, we've made, we've made our decisions on what's strategic to us and we must own. So some of the principles are we own all the pixels. Anything facing the end consumer, we own it all. Um, in many cases, we're using suppliers, you know, of, of other forms. Some are specialists within the industry. You know, for example, we uh, license our portfolio management software. We collect all the data to drive strategy selection and how we implement that portfolio and even how we operate that portfolio once it's in, in full operation to understand if there are shifts in strategy. That's part of the dynamic that uses technology and data through AI and models that continues to uh, refine our, 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 um, our operation and our service delivery model. Um, but there are other areas, as, as I said, with planning that we've chosen on our own. One, 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 um, one interesting story, and one that's not obvious, that we talk about is a system that we call ACE. Um, it's, a, it's actually quite an interesting story. And this is, a, you know, one of these things over the arc of your evolution. Um, it wasn't obvious, but it soon became obvious to us. So, so like many people, um, we started off with a, you know, a, a, a digital marketing platform. One of these systems where you can um, have a bunch of rules and you can, you can populate data in the system and template emails and be able to communicate with consumer, with your customer using that digital platform. Well, based on the depth and the breadth of the data that we had at a very early age, um, early stage in the company, we realized we were, we were just gonna break that system. It, it just, it, it, it wasn't capable of doing what we needed to do. But then we took a strategic step back and said, is this something we wanna farm out to another? One is because we have to put all those rules and all that data and domicile in that system, or do we wanna own this ourselves? And we made the commitment years and years ago to own that ourselves. And when I refer to ACE, it's our advice and communications engine. What we realized is that this consumer leads a multi-device life. They're connecting from their computer, an iPad, you know, an Android phone, an iPhone, and you actually need to orchestrate a journey in messaging to that consumer across that multi-device platform. It wasn't obvious, one, that we would break the system, but two, that the consumer would want to stay in touch in consistent messaging um, through not only email channel, but over SMS, mm. through alerts, through their mobile device. And, and let me tell you, there's nothing um, more annoying in an experience than when you start repeating yourself just because somebody comes in over another channel. So owning that structure, not only the messaging channel, but the advice itself, what rules do we have that dispatch advice on a very, very personalized basis to our consumer to allow us to continue to scale advice? So we're using the data in order to dispatch that advice in tandem with human driven advice. It allows us to continue to infinitely scale the business that we're in. And so I, that, 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 that decision in our ACE platform is something that evolved over time. It wasn't day one, but it wasn't recent. It's been something we've invested in over time. And it's one of the, um, one of the very unique offerings that we have, I think that's highly sophisticated, but appropriate for the, for the customer that we serve. Yeah, that really lets you scale that, that personalized and hyper-personalized, um, those insights and that guidance. I was actually the recipient of one of those messages this morning when I logged in to my personal well, capital account. I got a, a little pop-up that said, um, looking at the cash in my, across all my accounts, maybe if I, it looks like you had some algorithms that said, Based on my spending, I have excess beyond my emergency cash needs, let's say, to last me a few months. And couldn't I do better investing that? Um, and I love, by the way, and I, I've been telling all my clients they, they need this 
uh, I'm shocked how few have it still. Just the link to a, a scheduling uh, link to, to just make makes my life easier, makes your life easier. No phone tag and oh, can I, did I get you at a good time? So um, that, I don't know if that's exactly a good example of ACE or not, but uh, made me think of that. ACE in terms of the messaging, but as you said, scheduling, right? As it turns out, when you have a digital experience and that, you know, and that comes into reality and productivity tools of the advisor, it's another one of those decisions and the, and, and the list goes on, but being able to orchestrate at scale, scheduling out advisor time, but putting that right in front of the consumer, just cutting out all those other choppy processes that are inc entirely inefficient. Um, what you're seeing is nth evolution of our full stack um, in things like scheduling or advice and communications. And as I said, the, the, the list goes on, but we've made those strategic choices. Um, but on the flip side, we also leverage plumbing. I mean, there's so many, you know, cloud-based tools and, and, and other applications that we don't want to put, you know, our strategic dollars behind those. Rather, they're commoditized, and we build them as part of our platform. They, you, you might not see those as a customer-facing solution. We've woven all those pixels together to have a unified customer journey and experience. But we absolutely leverage those tools. We, we, it's, it's, it's too much to try to invest in all the tools. Otherwise, it would fall on the weight of itself. You, you mentioned tax management a couple of times, so I want to spend a minute on that. Based on your clientele and, and, and you know, million-dollar-plus households, often and opportunities to optimize around um, different aspects of their of their taxable relationships. So can you spend a minute on that and, and has that evolved over time um, in terms of how you're you're helping um, optimize, I'm guessing beyond just things like wash sale avoidance? Yeah, that's right. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of talk in the industry about, you know, you know, washing those gains against the losses. And that's just that's table stakes. That's the game that we're in. Um, but one thing that we, 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 we garner by virtue of this completely connected consumer is we see not only the accounts that uh, before the relation starts, uh, the, the opportunity to manage taxable and tax deferred accounts. Right. And a typical customer of ours, if, as you might imagine, you know, somebody isn't writing a $500,000 check. They're usually, you know, ACATing over a few accounts. Um, it's usually, you know, five to seven accounts that is our, you know, our starting point. We might bring that into a smaller chassis of, of, of fewer accounts, but it's, it's always a mix of uh, taxable and tax deferred accounts, or I shouldn't say always, it's quite typically a, a, a mix of both. So, you know, one thing that's not spoken about as much is tax location. So really taking a look at portfolio construction and a lot of the personalization that we do, and every one of our portfolios is personalized, not only just around preferences, but around tax location. So if you have those tax deferred accounts, there's, there's, there's no better way to put tax bearing securities um, to locate them within those accounts. And then, you know, the, the, where you're able to get the wash sales, we'll do that in the taxable stuff, you know, match the, the gains and losses. And that's what everyone's doing. So that's a big part of it. But it's also in just tax planning and tax strategy. Sometimes it's a multi-year plan because again, people aren't writing, you know, a multi hundred thousand dollar check, they're moving securities. So, I mean, the last thing you want to do to start off a relationship is, you know, blow out that portfolio, put it in yours, and here's your tax bill. Thank you very much. That's not a good start to a relationship. So managing that sensitivity beyond portfolio construction, but just the journey and transition from what you currently have to where you want to be is an important part of what we manage as well. For sure. Jay, you mentioned your average client's around 49.50. As you look longer term, longer range, especially with the empower piece around re retirement plan participants. Any thoughts around from a roadmap standpoint, um, looking to apply some of the same principles, uh, but two issues around decumulation or other issues related to people as they, as they age? Oh, sure. And, you know, it's not just from, you know, our relationship with empower and I expect more, more to blossom from this. Um, but Gavin, as you might expect people, you know, 4950, one of their biggest stress points, and we, we see it all the time, it's about, am I gonna have a successful retirement? Am I gonna outlive my money? Um, and so we, we built that in. So when I mentioned our financial planning software and running a cash flows analysis, we, 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 we actually show in the software in very simple and easy to use tools for the consumer. This isn't behind the curtain for the advisor, but we show the most likely case and the downside case of what's your chance towards retirement success. And we just give it a numerical score. We give it a probability score and people can understand that they can track the changes of that over the course of time. Right. Um, you know, also, you know, I think it was probably about a year and a half, two years ago, um, we uh, deployed a, a, a decumulation tool that showed our customer, our smart withdrawal tool. 
And so this is reserved for clients. So if you're a client of personal capital, we provide a smart withdrawal tool, which actually maps out every single account they have. And what's, you know, one way to think about it is if it's your money, it's what's the burn down list? Where do you start from? And how do you decumulate and do that in a tax optimized way in a very smart strategic way, rather than just, you know, thinking about the next dollar location very, very much matters. So we've built those tools as part of our uh, platform years ago. And do I expect we'll continue the heritage of, 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 of bringing in more tools? Absolutely. But equally important, I think more solutions too. You know, as the, 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 the customer or the client is in decumulation, it's one thing to play air traffic control. It's another thing to, to, to bring forward other solutions for them. And frankly, that's what our clients have asked us for. We love and trust what you're doing for us, but bring us more solutions, not just giving us advice, but actually help us fulfill. And so I think that will be, um, you know, a signal of where, of, of, of where the story continues. For sure. Hey, let's pivot for a minute to, to the advisor experience. And you touched on this a few minutes back. Tell us a little bit about your advisor talent profile, what a day in the life looks for them. And, and I, I'm even, I've got this kind of hypothesis that in this increasingly free agent world of advisors, they're going to look and say, where's, what's the best home for me with my practice? Who's giving me the best tools, the best ability to focus on what I do best, let technology um, handle what it does best and use some of these uh, client acquisition tools to, to, so I don't have to spend my days out there hunting for clients, but have other ways to bring clients in so I can focus on advising clients. So talk to us about the, the advisor experience. Sure. Well, the first thing I would say is, you know, we, 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 we receive rich talent. You know, a lot of people um, have proven success in this industry and, you know, whether that's on the acquisition of, of, of clients or relationship management side of clients. And as I mentioned, it's not this all in one advisor. We've actually broken down the role into six or seven discrete functions, um, you know, across a team and, and, and delivering that service as a team. Um, has been a winning strategy for us that we've been doing for for years and years. But but when you double click on the talent pool, um, you know what we typically see is you know people that have a success pattern over the course of time, but perhaps maybe not so much success that they're so deeply rooted in what they do and how they do it um, that it's hard for them to get away or go up a learning curve of doing something new. Because make no mistake, um, we we are doing something radically different when it comes to you know the the, the advisor desktop and the ergonomics of how they. In, uh, of how they engage with their existing prospects and clients um, over the over the arc of time, and so um, people that have shown that pattern of success, and you know, we 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 receive talent from the wirehouses, people that have been you know in large RA platforms um, throughout the industry, and we get we 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 get very rich, experienced talent. So that's that's the one the, the one side of it. The other side, I should say, is um, we're actually a hyper growth company. And we're manufacturing some talent inside of, of, of our walls too. So we have some other um, feeder streams. We have a farm system, so to speak, where many of our advisors are graduating from other internal roles where they get to understand how we're built, either from you know, an advisory support um, you know, out on the acquisition side role or an operational role. And we've seen some of our most successful advisors understand how it's all put together and then build themselves into or, or, or graduate into an advisory role. And we've seen this over the course of many, many years. And in, in many ways, what I think of what's happening at personal capital relative to the rest of the industry, I mean, the, the industry is aging out. But what we're doing is because of our growth and because of this farm system, we're creating a renewable resource. And so it's a combination of people with experience and people that you know, learn things anew. Um, but what I should say is the common trait across all of them is they deeply care about their clients whether it's winning those relationships or sustaining those relationships. And that all gets back to our mission and our values. And that's what's most important. As long as people understand what we're doing in a fiduciary model and being authentic to the, to the client, that's where it all starts. And quite frankly, we, we see an influx, not only because of the technology revolution and, and where's this puck going, but also the spirit of what we represent. And people understand in some of the other models, it's not always about the client. It's profit first, and then you know, hopefully the client can come along for that journey as well. Um, as as we've done with so many things in um, in the innovation that personal capital has brought to bear in this marketplace, we're also very very customer centric around the fiduciary model in that journey. And so people that have that you know kindred spirit um, find themselves you know in a, in a in a good position here at personal capital as well. Got it. Makes sense. So I had the pleasure of hearing you speak at Invest West 
a few years back, you were talking about the explosive growth that you're experiencing and expanding this advisor force to, uh, across different geographies um, to be in the right uh, you know, t time zones and all with, with your clients to make things a little bit better. So adding uh, across to keep up with demand. How, how have, tell us a little bit about that journey and how things have changed in terms of the remote landscape since COVID-19. Uh, in particular, what's the interaction with clients been? What types of issues are, are they uh, more, more interested in talking about? But you know, start, start us off in terms of that, that uh, expansion to meet uh, growing demand. Sure. Well, as, as you know, since inception, you know, we've been virtually delivered, but it's predominantly been from, you know, from centralized locations or hubs, you know, we don't call them call centers because it's, you know, it's highly virtual, right? It's video, it's SMS, it's, it's a little bit of everything. And, um, and that's been a rich part of our heritage. I think a couple of years ago, back at that Invest West con, uh, conference, I was talking about an expansion, you know, from Denver, which was our largest advisor hub at the time, into the Dallas marketplace and into Atlanta. Um, Yes, it did bring us into every time zone to better serve our customers. We have a rich concentration of prospects and clients in each one of those geographies. So that's ever, ever important. But it also allowed us to tap into, you know, a, a more vast talent pool. And we've, we've ex experienced and enjoyed great growth and success in bringing on our advisory force in those, in those geographies. And then the lightning strike hit back in, uh, back in, back in, you know, Q1 of, of this year, um, the advent of COVID-19 and what do we all need to do as leaders um, in response to that. Uh, on March 13th, pretty early, you know, before a lot of the national declaration, um, you know, myself and our leadership team, we just made the executive decision. Um, you know, in many ways, this was a business decision, but it was also a people decision. And, and, and it was also a moral decision about what's the right thing to do for our people. And we made a, a pretty bold commitment. We had done a lot of preparatory work. You know, it, it's, it's interesting to see, you know, over the, over the past few years and years, you know, the talk of a pandemic as a business continuity exercise and what do you actually do? And um, actually, you know, business continuity professionals really made their money, um, you know, uh, come Q1. And so we, we were greatly prepared, but we made the call and we said, starting tomorrow, we will be operating out of our homes and you know in spite of operating operating virtually and out of and, and out of hubs that's a big shift to expect people to work you know um out of whatever domain that they happen for, for wherever they dwell um and in that shift um i'm very very proud to say which was uncommon in this industry we were able to make that shift in about 24 hours um the responsiveness of our technology and particularly our our it and our technology operations team um was unbelievable and we were in our stride, you know, within the, the first couple business days. Um, and that was the right decision. Again, it was a people decision. It was the right thing. And, 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 and at the time, um, we all reflected and said, you know, this might be a hard and tough decision, but we're going to reflect on this as being the right decision. And absolutely was, you know, with the, 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 the outbreak of COVID-19 and some of the, you know, shared workspaces, there were um, occurrences. And so we took people out of harm's way. Um, and what happened um, as you might expect is, you know, those that are on, you know, one side of that lightning strike, this is a massive accelerant. I mean, here we are, you know, leaning in about offering virtual advice in the face of locally dispatched advice. And in many ways, just people are now being classically trained, all of us as professionals, and so many of our prospective clients and clients are professionals, you're forced into doing Zoom meetings or doing digitally oriented things. So everyone's now being classically trained to engage this way. Um, and oh, by the way, when the markets are under financial duress and we see that story unfolding and we're telling that story, are you okay? Or do you have an all weather portfolio to prepare yourself now? That one-on-one -on -one personalized messaging with the capabilities to not miss our stride in spite of all the market duress um, really served us well. So, you know, uh, Q1 ended up being um, a, a great growth cycle for us. And we've continued to ride that wave into, into, into Q2. So, um, Making this commitment to virtual because nobody saw this pandemic coming uh, turned out to be, you know, just a great accelerant and commitment uh, for us uh, to have made to our employees. And we're, I would say, enjoying the results of that from a business standpoint now. Absolutely. Any lessons learned you, you can share with, with your, your colleagues out there in terms of moving to the remote environment, how you've adapted? Um, you had some advantages, obviously, in terms of the virtual practice, but like you said, the remote world is different. Any anything you've learned along the way that, that you would share? 
Well, I don't know if it's anything I learned along the way, but just this, this, this framework that I talk about and being a purpose-driven company and being so mission-oriented, but also reflecting on our values. I mean, that creates culture and it's very palpable culture. I mean, we have a very, very spirited community of people that are on this rocket ship, all the stewards of personal capital. Um, and probably, you know, not probably, the biggest stress for me was how are people doing? How are people doing remotely? And how are we maintaining our culture? And, you know, sustaining that momentum um, you know, so so we thought that we had, you know, all of these, you know, uh, the, the strong base and strong platform, but we've continued to reinforce and nurture that. So just remaining connectivity with our employees, persistently surveying them, what's really on your minds, reaching out to them and staying connected with them, um, having virtual get togethers, we are literally doing everyone sessions over video uh, about every seven to 10 days. And we found that's been incredibly important just to remain connected with people and so far so good. And I, I, I still think we have a long runway ahead of us in terms of operating virtually and remotely. So, um, you know, one thing that's really helped us is because we've scaled up when we had critical mass when we did pivot to virtual as opposed to being, you know, up this, you know, really, really steep part of our um, enterprise growth. Um, it's really, really helped us to maintain that continuity of, of, of personnel. So really, I think the big lesson for me or the reinforcing thing is the importance of mission, culture, values, and being able to use that as your compass for how to step forward, but remaining connected with our employees. I think it's been the most important thing for us and, and so far so good. That's great. So in the middle of the pandemic, you struck a deal, just, just a little deal on on. June 29th, I think you announced your news uh, to undergo a business combination with Empower Retirement, the second largest retirement plan provider in the U.S. Um, so what does that mean for, for you, for personal capital, your customers, future customers? What, what's it mean? What do you hope for the future and, and to come out of that combination? Sure. It's a great question. So, um, yeah, it's amazing that something like this can happen at, during such a time. But, you know, in many ways, you know, I, I think it was a it was it was a big wake up call for everyone to say you need to have a virtual delivery model. And and as you might expect, Gavin, we've been, you know, really a, an attractive profile for many. We've had conversations with many in enterprise over the course of years. And for us, you know, um, we've had, you know, the luxury of being, you know, a very successful um, growth enterprise with enough, uh, enough legs to stand on our own, you know, in, in perpetuity. So, you know, nothing by way of necessity, but rather by way of opportunity. And what we found in our discussions with Empower, um, and, you know, maybe no surprise here, but the, the, the mission-oriented, value-driven culture that we have, and what we learned, you know, across, you know, the enterprise of Empower was something that was just so shared. When I, when, I, when I look at the values that we have, we have five values, they map just, almost perfectly to, to empower. Another thing is um, because we're in adjacent spaces, if we look at this as being, you know, my data is probably a little bit, you know, antiquated here, but if it's a $48 trillion industry and 36 trillion of that is discretionary wealth management and 12 is retirement, we're both facing different, um, you know, different uh, segments of the industry um, on the one hand. So what that, what that means is for, for personal capital is we have, someone that's philosophically aligned, committed to innovation and sustaining growth as our independent enterprise and personal capital and what we're doing to go win relationships and, and, and continue to serve clients every single day. But at the same time, it affords us the opportunity of partnering with somebody at greater scale, um, having that belief and sustained investment and in certainty in, in very uncertain times is very, very powerful for us. And what's more, the advent of being in these adjacent businesses also has some interlocking capabilities too. One, it allows us to you know, provide some, um, some benefit to them, but I think there's also some mutual benefit uh, for personal capital and personal capital's uh, clients, um, current and future. So great opportunity for us. And we think we found you know, uh, a wonderful life partner and we're right in this middle of you know, having announced signing uh, at the end of Q2, and we're in the middle of the journey, you know, expecting uh, a close sometime in the back half of this year. Terrific. Well, best of luck with that. It, 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 the synergies are, are definitely clear. What, what, what do you see it doing for, um, when you think about Empower, or just that, that business line generically, um, for their clientele? We see a lot of firms, you know, they, retirement plan, uh, 
uh, firms that have all these participants, they, you know, they're not just living in this world of retirement uh, plans. They have a financial life. Um, I'm sure there's many clients you have that that are participants in those plans and others. So, what do you see this this combination is doing for people in those types of plans? Sure. As I said, the benefits for us and then the longevity and and, and benefits for our clients very very clear as it pertains to empower and their existing business i mean what i would say in the retirement management or more specifically in the defined contribution um, business it's really what's happening at those plan sponsors of those employers and that customer that's the buyer they're looking for more than just a portal that you log into and you know pick from a fund lineup you know in a in a 401k or whatever vehicle you're using in order to deliver um you know the the the, the retirement investment solution they're looking for something far more vast. And there's a tsunami that's happening within that retirement management space. And it's all about wellness and it's broad-based wellness. And it's about that same holistic nature of their employee. It's not just about that investment solution. It's about providing wellness and security and ease of mind for their employees. It's removing stress. And there's a, you know, there's industrial logic behind that because Stress is more costly for employers to manage. So this commitment to wellness um, that's happening out on the frontier of, of, of the plan sponsor is very instructive for what our technology affords in the context of wellness when bringing that to empower either their legacy customers or their new customers that they will garner. And by virtue of looking at the financial whole, and so if you, if you, if you, if you, if you double click past that plan sponsor or that employer and go to the consumer, consumer doesn't care. It's their money. And they want to have certainty and wellness and, and feeling like they're, you know, they're, they're not missing out and making bad decisions and they're doing the right thing with their money. And, you know, yes, they think of the sleeve of their retirement and that's their nest egg and something they're investing in ta tax deferral typically, but they're also looking at just their money and their stress is not parsing out the different accounts and, you know, and, and breaking out the taxonomy of their investments It's about having success. And so that shared mission and set of values that we have in power over the arc of time, I would anticipate that these lines get blurred. And it's, again, it's all about the customer and putting the customer in the, in the middle. And how do you deliver the most innovation success for that customer and do right by that customer? Um, we've got a good track record for the last 10 years in doing that within our space. And I think it's going to add immense value for Empower and for their, for their business and ultimately their consumers that are, that are, that are in tow. Right. And in terms of empowering that journey and, and wellness with, with a holistic view, you recently launched the, the financial roadmap tool. Can you tell us a little bit about that um, and maybe use that as a springboard to talk a little bit more about your, your roadmap, uh, where you get inspiration from, the role that, that both clients and advisors play in, in where you go with your platform? Yeah, it's a great question. And again, thank you for having such, you know, an astute understanding of what it is we're doing, because it's nuanced. It's all kind of in this realm of planning. And as I mentioned, you know, we have a cash flow view for the households, and we have the ability to put in spending and savings goals over time and understand your probability. But, you know, in order to create the the, the day to day behavior, to reinforce the long term benefits, um, we introduced our financial roadmap. And it's really just breaking down planning. And it's using that consumer data, the rich data that we have, and using that and developing models to say, what is the next most important thing that you need to do, client? And mapping that out, it's, it's literally a lifeline of, of milestones and what we think is the next best thing. And it's actually engaging that consumer. One really important thing, I haven't shared this, um, and again, it's not an obvious thing, is the level of engagement that we have. You know, We talked about the complexity of the consumer and having them um, gain value by the insights. Um, one, one, one way that I really know that it's working, it's one of the statistics I'm most proud of, Gavin, is the persistent engagement we have with our, with our consumer. And so we have, you know, over, you know, we have millions of people that are using our technology, but those that are really deeply engaging, particularly this mass affluent high net worth client with complexity, when we look through our data and those that are connecting, um, which is a vast population of, of, of these customers, um, the stat that I know that we're winning, because we all talk about, you know, what we're doing in the advice tech revolution and how we have game changing. We use all these, you know, um, emphatic terms of describing how great we are. At the end of the day, it's what the customer chooses to do or not to do. And so we have these free tools and we've been out in the wild for coming up on nine years now. And we go look at all of those cohorts of people that are qualified for this core, you know, mass affluent wealth solution. When we look at those that have come into our platform in the last 
um, quarter, that number is greater than 75%, all of them over that arc of time. And what's even more profound is when we look through how frequently are they using the system, they're using it every other day. They've made this part, this is the principal destination of how they see and understand their finances. And that's, that's winning for us. That's what we wanted to do. That's how you garner their attention by using award-winning technology to actually have something that's usable, not because they're paying rent on it or you know, we don't guilt them into using it. They're using it because they're finding utility. And so the financial roadmap is another great way that we can just break this down into the small nudges and behavioral things that consumers can do to improve their outcome, because that's what it's all about. And we actually show the probability score and we show the results of that over time. You know, one thing we're really proud of um, in the first half of this year, just another stat to throw in there, is we increased our likelihood of retirement success in the first half of the year by almost 10% for our existing clients. When we go look, just look through the data and look at that score. And that's profound for us. And that's the type of thing we're doing. And the financial roadmap is, is just another tactic that we're using to pull it off. There's another part of it too, because that's that guides the consumer on what to do next. And as I said, it's not just that dimension, it's also the access of the advisor. We also have something called advisor GPS. What's the most important thing that you need to do across the portfolio of your clients that you serve? And we prioritize that, rank that, and serve that up for our advisors. It's just another way that we're mapping our technology and the innovation, not just for the consumer, but to the advisor to make sure that we're prioritizing their activities too. And, and, and our advisors love it. I mean, it just, it, 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 it's kind of a self-tuning way of understanding what's most important right. for you in managing all your relationships. That's great. That stat around engagement every other day is pretty mind-blowing. Um, I think virtually every firm listening to this or watching this will be envious of that. And it shows you because everyone at this point has some kind of a client portal, aggregation capability, planning. Um, but to me, what it says is, there's there's a real art and science to how you present that and how you just the 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 effectiveness of doing it in a way where if i've got all these choices like you said people have accounts all over the place i've got all those choices w what's going to be my go-to where am i going to live in my phone on my laptop um, how are things served up in a way that it really is empowering me so that my hat is off to to you sir on that uh that stat that is that is impressive yeah um, thank you back to those back to those humble beginnings when we thought about that little project that was happening in a pool house who knew that we'd be able to influence so many people and this became the principal de destination of how they manage their finances and it, we 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 haven't seen anything like it frankly we've 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 canvassed a lot of other financial services and fintech solutions and and it it, it, it is really a standout so thank you yeah we, we appreciate that yeah so let's bring this back to to you now Jay, you've been with Personal Capital since really the beginning, since 09. What's the new partnership with Empower mean for you? Your position, are, are you gonna ride off into the sunset on your, on your uh, rainbow unicorn? Uh, or do you see yourself stay, <laughs> staying involved in the next chapter? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, we, we, we announced it, you know, and, you know, there, then, you know, things like LinkedIn, there's just an influx of, you know, compliments and high fives and wow, that's impressive. A lot of, a lot of oohs and ahs. Um, and, 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 and a term that I saw for many was like, wow, great exit. And, and I actually took a step back from that. And, um, you know, I think, I, I think I issued a blog post a few weeks ago, just to speak to this. Um, cause a lot of even our clients had that, what, you know, what does this mean for personal capital and its leadership? Um, for me, you know, not, not, not an exit. I mean, for me, this is an accelerant. So what I think about what we've done over, you know, the decade plus that we've been, you know, on this journey, um, you know, one way to look at it is, you know, when we talk about all those headline stats about the, you know, the addressable market and discretionary wealth or even retirement, um, it's not lost upon me that we've been at this for a decade and we still have, you know, you know, we, we have, you know, over 13 billion in assets under managed. We have, you know, the most that we've ever had, but, you know, on balance, that's still relatively small. What the alignment of our philosophies with somebody like Empower and the scale that they have, right? I mean, we have, you know, I think 800 billion of connected investable assets on our platform. I mean, they're, they're managing nearly that amount. They're, they're supporting 40,000 enterprises and 10 million consumers. So what I think about myself and as well as what's inspirational for my, for my, for my leadership team um, is the opportunity to do everything that we're doing in many ways, keep doing what we're doing, the journey and the mission that we're on. But we have this step function opportunity to just increase our scale. And that's exciting. I mean, you know, um, when I talk to, you know, uh, 
Fritz Robbins, our head of technology, said, when I think of scale at this level, it makes my heart go pitter pat. And I think that's true for all of us. So what, what, what this means for myself, as well as for my executive leadership team, Gavin, is we've made a multi-year commitment to continue the journey. I mean, we're, we're fired up. I mean, we didn't look at this as being, you know, uh, an, an exit path or an out. We looked at this as being a springboard and, um, and, and the ambition that we have in tandem, you know, to the CEO, Ed Murphy uh, at Empower Retirement, um, we're just getting started. So we're really excited about, you know, the, um, the interlocking capabilities that we have and for us, the acceleration that we have. So no, for, for, for a kid like me, um, an opportunity like this, it's, uh, this is absolutely an accelerant. So I'm excited about the future. That is really exciting. Well, thank you for spending time with, with us today, Jay. Next 10 years, who who knows what's going to happen? It's uh, we'll be keeping our eyes on you, and uh, we won't wait ten years though to check in on on your progress. I think uh, it's going to be a lot of exciting chapters between uh, between now and then. So thank you so much for the time today. Thank you, Gavin. Really enjoyed the conversation, and would love to keep in touch. Uh, keep up the great work. Really appreciate it.